Hello, welcome to the Conflict Transformation Coming Down to Earth online summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm really happy uh, to have you here today and we have an amazing, beautiful human being with us today for a, hopefully a very generative conversation. Welcome, Gabriel. Hey, welcome. Hello. Hi. Here. You're touching the ground in, in Galilea, yes? Yes, wow. yes, in the mountains of the Galilee. So here we are in a conversation. I'm, I'm touching the ground in Faro in the south of Portugal and you are in Galilea. Wow. So Gabriel, is, you, you are a musician, a radical creative, a storyteller, a writer, a speaker from the Fertile Crescent Holy Land. You were born in Cordoba, in Argentina, and you've been uh, doing sacred activism work. You co-founded the Sulia Peace Project in, some many years ago. You initiated the Middle East peace gatherings between Iranians, Israelis, and internationals in the mountains of Turkey between 2009 2012. And you've been traveling the globe, performing music with prayer performance, then sacred play shops, uh, interfaith and multicultural rituals. You have created four albums of music and you founded the Metroton Ritual Theater Collective and created the Hebrew Holiday Gatherings for renewal and synchronization of Hebrew, Hebrew wisdom. And for the past four years, you've been a core member of Defend the Sacred Alliance and you're currently writing your first novel and autobiographical fiction of sorts. Welcome, my dear friend. Welcome. I'm really happy to, to have you in our and, and share your gifts with the audience. So perhaps the best place to start is really to invite you to just tell us a bit of your story and how you, how you came about this kind of work, what led you to also explore the nature of conflict and tensions and work in a particularly challenging place of the world, which has been like suffering from chronic ongoing conflict uh, in, in multiple ways. Uh, and, and that was, yeah. So my friend, welcome once again, and we, we would love to hear a bit of your story. Yeah, so uh, I was born uh, from, a, like I'm a first generation Argentinian, so I was already a foreigner when I was born. I was always the outsider, so I had to deal with conflict and not fitting in and bridging different cultures and different languages. My father was a rabbi, an American rabbi, which was really weird in a Catholic Argentina during the dictatorship. He was fighting for human rights, and I became an activist, human rights activist. So I was bridging a lot of worlds since I was born. So I guess that, you know, I was shorter than everybody else. I was smaller than everybody else. So I had to deal somehow with bigger guys bullying me in school. And even going to school for me was like out of the question. They kicked me out of kindergarten. Uh, and uh, because I didn't want to drink milk at five because I didn't like milk and I didn't believe in schedules. So I was like a, you know, pre, pre pre-K anarchist. And, uh, and then my father said, okay, he can't do it. So he took me to his job, you know? And so I would sit under his desk and the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo would come to talk to him and the director of the Philharmonic and the ambassador of this. And I was Perhaps it's four just, years old, you know. Sorry, and I, Gabriel, just, just, to, uh, just to say, because m many people might not be aware of that, but the, yeah. the, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo are mothers of the disappeared people yes. during the dictatorship, right? Yeah, they they were organized were, and they were doing every day. Because they couldn't stop and be together in those times, they would walk around the. the yeah, once a week on Thursday, once a week. Were more than thirty thousand people were killed in a period of ten years, even less. And my father was very active with them, and so I was part. I was a witness, and my father would ask me questions when I was even four years old. I remember learning the word interdependent, so I knew 
it wasn't dependent and it wasn't independent. It was interdependent. So here I was, you know, being Tiknat Khan at age four, like interbeing and in this whole Charles Eisenstein model coming right, you know, from childhood, even though nobody, you know, my father was bred, his teachers were uh, one of the best friends of Martin Luther King, uh, Rabbi Heschel, who walked with him in Selma, Alabama, who was a Holocaust survivor and a Hasidic uh, rabbi that uh, became a, a, a very big activist against the Vietnam War in the States. And the other teacher of my father was Martin Buber. Uh, so I came already built in, you know, as a as a mystical anarchist football player, you know, like, so that's what I did all day long. I played football and I used to transmit games between Buddha, Moses, Isaiah, Jesus. Those were the players of my games. So I, I had a reality which was integrating fantasy, art, sports, nature, healing, prophecy. Those were common words in my, in my upbringing. And so for me, the school was really ridiculous. The material they taught me there, I couldn't understand why I was going there. And uh, yeah, uh, actually I was always we the weird one in the group because my father had an accent in Spanish and my mother too. And they would pick me up at school. I say, don't talk to me in English and don't talk to me in Spanish. Don't talk to me at all. And like, I was like, you know, always the weird one. I was Jewish with the non-Jews. I was human rights with the bourgeois. I was, uh, you know, football with the intellectuals. I was philosophical within the football team. So I, I always was had to deal with conflict in a way, you know. Um, and um, I had to learn early on because I was short and small uh, to talk fast and talk my way and empathy my way out of conflict you know so like in, in my own body so uh, yeah so so from early on I, I and as I said you know my father was going to jails saving people's lives uh, we were threatened so the conflict was super close to my house and the 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 the, the secret the police knew when I was coming out of school I was threatened my sister's and uh, so, so, so the whole story with conflict was really early on. And I kind of left Argentina when I was 22, like really for good. And I uh, started in Greece. I was writing poetry then uh, and getting uh, like really feeling my shadow for the first time really powerfully. And writing was a very good exorcism for me. And at some point... Uh, after all my travels, uh, Greece, Paris, uh, New York, uh, then Africa and India and all this, there, there became like a, a thirst for the collective, not just the individual integration and the poet, and the, but a, a, a sense that I, I felt for community. And um, I mean, nature was a big part of my healing in Greece. And, and then when I got to Africa and then in Sinai, where I lived for one year before I moved to Israel, like my ancestors. And there I, I found the simplicity of the Bedouin and the nature. And I learned a bit of my first Arabic. And slowly a prophecy started popping up from the crescent where I was, you know, brought up with these ideas, but also all of a sudden I was seeing pomegranates and I got to Israel and, you know, and the, the actual trees that these prophets were, the actual places where the donkeys were going around with these prophets, not for profit, you know, and, and, the, and, and this mystical environment of the Galilee that, that is uh, so powerful. And we transported all this into a, a theater collective ritual theater collective and we were dealing with Rumi and the Kabbalah which was unheard of I'm talking about 1994 people said we were like uh, 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 cursed because we were dealing with forbidden subjects my father had just died I was 27 years old and I was uh, in the in the ritual theater play I was uh, in the rehearsals I was digging an actual grave in different places in nature and 
and you know saying my monologues out of the grave uh, and like this um, we started dwelling into all the mystical traditions we had a very special group so some people would go to china study martial arts come back after six months another one would go to do yoga in india and come back uh, you know uh, we went to africa and came back and everybody would teach each other what uh, you know so it was it was like a creative family a spiritual artistic family and when that ended uh, you know for reasons like like you say you said before something that rings a bell which is we have all these amazing projects and amazing visions of the new paradigms but we're still the same people you know grounded in the old paradigm and so we fall and falter and 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 our shadow just you know shines out uh, out of us oozes out and we can't help it sometimes and 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 so that's when uh, groups that were holding an amazing vision fall because there's different pulls you know in people and uh, after that uh, i started rehydrating my own tradition the holidays of the jewish people because i didn't find myself in israel in terms of my spirituality and for me the hinduism that was here was too much hinduism without any connection to what was happening here the vipassana was hot the osho was but i needed some connection that wasn't orthodox to my own ancestry and that's how we created all these holiday gatherings where we had 200 people already families with kids and i i felt in india when i was there that either i create a place spiritually for me or i have to leave israel and and so because my best friends who were in the theater created a band the music band that i wasn't part of it so i had to create my own space and they collaborated with me but uh, we were all living in this village where you know like uh, frustrated rock where a famous rock artists would come and you know uh, dated gurus and uh, indian gurus and people sufis would all come to visit us because there was something happening and in the 90s the whole culture of festivals started in israel and we were a big part of that uh, first the rainbow gatherings arrived from europe and it took a very very prophetic flavor here in israel uh, where most of the world music and the yoga and the martial arts and all of the conflict resolution, it all started there. And then it went to the theater collective. And then when that was ending, and then we went to into uh, resacralizing uh, first through the arts, the prayer. But then we went into sacralizing the arts in the uh, you know in the uh, the prayer through the arts. And then when that was over, the second intifada started, and uh, you know, in the in between, uh, Rabin, the prime minister of Israel, was killed, and uh, that was the end of you know the beginning of the end. And then the second intifada came, and um, that's when I felt that I couldn't just deal with my you know my own tradition. I had to grow to the family of Abraham, not just and Sarah and Hagar. And not just to for Isaac, who as a, as, a, as an Israelite, and so we started this Sulha Peace Project, which was kind of the roots of it was in Tantur, in this monastery. There was this interfaith gathering in 2000, 2001, 2000, I think, just when the after the Intifada started. There were still bullets, as I told you, in the building in the monastery. It's the only place where Palestinians can cross from east to West Jerusalem without a, you know, a document because it's a monastery. And this organization spent, like Zen Buddhist organization, they were trying to create an interfaith peacemaker community. And so they send invitations to rabbis and imams and sheikhs from all over the world and mon monastic priests and Hindus, every, everything. And, they spent like 15,000 bucks just to bring people to Jerusalem in the middle of the Intifada. And I was a, a, an observer. And uh, one of the things that I felt was, I mean, the, the, the Roshi, the, the head of the, the gathering, said in the beginning, listen, the first thing I'm going to say is that I resign. 
and that I have nothing to do with this and whatever you decide, I'll support. And so he stayed in silence for the first two days and he put this guy who came to do all sorts of games like they do in Hewlett Packard for teamwork or in Coca-Cola. Okay, his, his name was Purna and he had sandals, but the games were, and the priests from Europe and the sheikhs from the, they were all getting super angry because they were saying in their breaks, you know, we're in a war. What, the, what, what are we doing here? You know, playing co- trust games. And at some point in the second day, I said, you know, first time I talked, so if we don't start smiling, there will never be peace. And everybody was in awe, you know, the, the, the nuns almost fainted. People fell on the floor. The, the, immediate, the facilitator didn't know. And Bernie Glassman, the Roshi, who hadn't talked in two days, he got up, he put a red nose on his nose. He took a red nose from his pocket, put a red nose on my nose. And all of a sudden, three other guys put red noses on their noses and started dancing around me saying, you're now initiated into the order of disorder. And then the whole uh, group divided into subgroups and I was part of the vision. And that's where I came with the Sulha Peace Project vision. The whole story from the Galilee all the way to Jerusalem in between Jewish and Palestinian villages, trying to create a space, a, a microcosmos of what, you know, holistic peace, salam, shalom is like. So that's getting closer to the, the conflict transformation work that I, that I began. But it, as I said, it was always present in me. If it was with the Orthodox Jewish and me or with the people who were totally against any kind of mysticism and me, I always had to, you know, train empathy and train ways to tickle the heart of people. And, uh, and, and and go beyond the reptilian brain, you know, because this mm. is where the old story is entrenched, you know, like in the Lord of the Ring, my precious, you know, like <laughs> it, it, uh, you kill my father, I'm going to kill your son. And like this, like, you know, stays perpetuates this hate that people don't even remember where it comes from. And, um, and get to the limbic part of the brain, which, you know, you can do through a song and, Maybe I'm thinking it's possible to sing a song. Yes, come on. Okay, I have my guitar right here. <laughs> and uh, mm. so it's a very simple song, but we used it in the youth uh, uh, encounters that we call Sulhita. It was the little Sulha. Uh, Sulha is the indigenous way of mediation from the Middle East that the Bedouins used to have with three cups of coffee, a white flag, a council of elders called Jaha that is respected by the two feuding parties. And we took that as a trampoline for our project. We were on the way to Sulha because it could take 40 years to have the conditions for Sulha to happen, which involves a common meal, the council of elders, the two feuding parties saying, I'm sorry, and and the three cups of coffee and the handshake. And once the handshake happens, that's it. So we had this youth project where we would meet a uh, hundred kids, 50 Palestinian, 50 Israelis, and do all sorts of things for a week in the nature, in the desert, in the mountains. And this is one of the songs that we used to sing. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, I'm going to try and sing it in English and then maybe a little Hebrew because it's a Hebrew song. Mm. And see if I can touch uh, the limbic brain of all of you and melt the reptile in us. Cause I'm a mirror to you, and you're a mirror, mirror unto me. Cause I'm a mirror to you, and you're a mirror, mirror unto me. Respect you. 
respect you and you will respect me cause I'm a mirror to you and you're a mirror mirror on to me accept you and you will accept me cause I'm a mirror to you and you're a mirror mirror on to me Cabe la cabe otra a cabe cabe ti rey leja rey rey a tali Hug you, hug you, and you will hug me, cause I'm a mirror to you, and you're a mirror, mirror on to me. Porque soy espejo pa' ti Y tú eres espejo Espejo para mí Wow, thank you Thank you, Gabriel So hopefully that brings you into a, Us into a, a different field From where the cortex can start talking about anything Water conflicts, sharing the mayor, <sighs> making a vegetable garden together, a gift yeah. economy. You know, I was, the heart is open, then, then, then you can do it. But if you start from a reptilian binary a model, you're doomed because you're going to keep repeating. That's what happens to most activists. They are stuck in the same, they want to change the world. They have amazing ideas, but their ways are still reflecting their old patterns. And, yeah. and that's why it's like a, the, the way we've been responding to crisis is part of the crisis. Yeah. Yes, yes. And lovers, the same thing, you know, in Eros, in the, in the police and everywhere in the Gnosis, you know, even in, in medicine work, people sometimes can't integrate it because they're trying to integrate it from a place uh, of the old story and yeah. and and that and that is the problem that there is not enough hubs of the new story yet and so we need to nurture those those you know new soils where where trust is is the currency you know and people get organized at the pace of trust like they say yeah so that's great so You, you mentioned a couple of things that for me are really interesting in the exploration of what other ways of being in conflict or in tension situations can help us um, open up new possibilities. And, and for me, it's very interesting to hear a bit more, particularly because you've, of, of your uh, upbringing and, and you've been working in a particularly, as we started in the beginning saying, in a particularly difficult context where people are kind of really entrenched in, in, in opposite sides and it's very hard to come together, old hatreds and even sometimes uh, too far too far on the past but still, still informing a lot of how people show up today. So what have you been noticing about other ways of, of thinking and then also other ways of being in such a situation where you, you apparently are living a intractable conflict and intractable problem that nobody seems to figure out how to uh, untie. So like, what have you been discovering that works in terms of, of practices, but also like what ways of thinking help 
moving towards those practices? If you could talk a bit more about, about sure, that. sure. Well, we, you talk, you mentioned the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. Just imagine, like the imagination it took for women to stand together as mothers. This 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 voice of the mother in South America to put it in the front and put in white handkerchiefs and the name of their sons and daughters who were killed and go around in a silent circle. My dad was with them every Thursday with the Peace Nobel Peace Prize, Perez Esquivel, and some other old socialists, Alicia Moro de Justo. And so that, that those are the types of things, you know. I, I think reality has a, a, a very strong defense system, especially when you go to change it through the same vehicles and the same ways that you tried before, it's not going to work because the defense system is already knows, you know, those ways. And so, okay, we're going to be against this. So the monster gets bigger, you know, when you're against and against and against and against, you just give, give, give power to the monster, you know, and, and and that those things like uh, Deleuze and Guattari used to say, you know, the the, the people uh, I read it from. But basically, I I think uh, we need to surprise reality, mm. the defense mechanisms of reality. So if somebody's angry and you make them smell a rose by mistake maybe the smell is going to do much more than you telling her them that, you know, relax, don't be angry. You know, that's never works, you know, with somebody who is in conflict. And so maybe a color, maybe, you know, when you're playing with a baby and he starts crying and all of a sudden you go to a different sense, a different dimension and the baby calms down. We all, we are, we're all babies. Mm -hmm. We are looking for that trampoline, which is the holy one. You know, it's like wherever we fall, we fall on top of the divine. It doesn't matter. You know, we, the, the trampoline is big enough and we're going to keep falling, but we always fall on top of the divine. So if you see life as a trampoline or the divine as a trampoline and everything is the divine, even our shit and shadow is part of the divine. So we're going to always fall on top of God, you know, so it's, it's easier <laughs> to fall, you know, and, and I think creativity and imagination is what always perforates the, the guards, you know, it's like, uh, when, when, when you, when you use, uh, nouns and concepts, they're very easy to, for the guard to fight back. But when you use verbs, then it's impossible to fight back. Then it perforates reality and it's, it shifts it. And nouns are like, you know, cemeteries of verbs. Nouns are, are the place where, where action dies, when we get, okay, and I believe that, when you start believing your thoughts, you know, and you start believing in them. I mean, what is that, you know? It's funny you say that because somehow it's like, because the the verb kind of express something fundamentally uh, significant to life that is that it's always in movement right it's not, nothing is ever stopped exactly but we've been pulled out to 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 think in terms of in deterministic terms even to our, even about ourselves that we have yeah. these fixed identities that if we don't hold on to them we'll lose who we are and don't get this perspective of of the, that we we are actually the flow we are actually the movement and just that sometimes I can, I, I meet you and I see you in your form and with your face and I can see a bit of that movement. I can hit that movement because it's like, that's your track of life. Yeah. The, the, the marks on your face, mm -hmm. but it's actually the movement. So that, that's really interesting because I have, I have been talking a lot about this, that also, and it's one of the challenges of this summit is the, that when we talk too much about things, we kind of deaden them also because language yeah is great to communicate but it, it's not the thing we're just trying to kind of grasp what is it that what is it this by words because it's the way we have to communicate and because i'm really grateful you bring music because that's another yeah way. because we are we are mystery we are particles of the mystery and if we don't accept that we're always going to be fighting in a binary way to fix something. You know, we have this thing in the West since the Greeks or even maybe since the Babylonians 
that we need to fix this and this is the solution and these are the bad guys and these are the good guys. And let's say we in the left or the whatever, the ecological movement uh, are the good guys and the fossil fuel, uh, you know, but then we lose what's happening within us, within them, within everybody. There's no them. Actually, it's all inside us. We have a little Hitler inside. We have a little everything inside. And so we we need to face those things in a way that uh, can allow other witness, other, other, you know, communities to witness us in those places where, where we are vulnerable, where we can open up to mystery, where we're not looking for a solution. Whereas you say the solution comes from the place where we can listen to what the trees have to say. After all, human beings, we are the youngest creature in the planet. We're just like, you know, what, 15 years old, full of pimples and like comparing to mountains or rivers or trees we know nothing even compared to animals we're here for a short bit of time you know in walking on twos with five fingers and we invent stuff and we don't even know why it just feels good to say we're going to live in mars so we're going to invent a, i don't know a tv a cell phone and, and we don't even know you know indigenous people still have a memory of what, what the original instructions, as they say in the Lakota tradition were, you know. And these original instructions were us being humans in a way that is part of the harmony of all creatures in life. And we've lost that memory. And so that's why we need to look at indigenous peoples. And of course, they've been going through trauma for 500 years in the, the Americas and even more in Africa and in India and everywhere else in Australia. But some of these people hold the original instructions of what it is to be human from the word humus, from the earth, as children of the earth. You know, in Genesis, in my tradition, there's two stories of creation. One is where, you know, a man and women are separate and, the you know, the rib and then the if humans name all the animals and they control the garden. The other story is where we are stewards. There are two stories in Genesis. And, and the, the, the other story of creation is one that I, I connect much more. And that is that we're humans. You know, there was this fight between two angels if to create the human being or not. And they went to God and, and, and God asked, you know, one of the angels to say the angel of truth. Gabriel, you know, and he said the fire, you know, and he said, okay, should we? He said, of course not. Don't create the human, you know. He's a disaster. He's going to lie. He's going to kill. He's going to rob. He's going to destroy the, 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 the house, the, the, all the other creatures. And then they went to Michael, you know, the water and the, the, the angel of love and, and, and unconditional love and kindness. And, and he said, but have you heard when he sings? When he when he when he dresses up all colors and when he uh, tells somebody he loves them, did you see how the birds enjoy that and how the giraffes calm down and the mountains are you know blessed with the, with human songs and colors and art and prayers? So we we do have a role. I don't think human beings are shouldn't be here. We just forgot what our role is. And our role is all this regenerative stuff that you're talking about. And you cannot get through without a transparency in the shadow of the collective, in the shadow of a little group that you're working with, in the shadow of yourself. And for that, you need to create trust. You know, you, you need to create a situation where um, there is trust. And that is the, the currency and the pace of, 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 of the action. You don't do something before everybody is fully into it in body, emotion, mind, and spirit, in the four elements. So, you know, just as an activist, you know, or and you have an idea you... and you want to do it, but that's not enough if you have an idea and you want to do it, even if it's a great idea, you know. And, and how, how have you experienced creating trust in, in between people or between groups of people who have, who have, who have like deep wounds, like 
for instance, the case in, in the Middle East? Like, what have you been seeing well, working in that you, process? Yeah, a different story when we got to Turkey with the Iranians, right? Mm. And so, I mean, I was, uh, this was in a gathering uh, in, in Turkey. And, you know, in those type of gatherings, you wake up some days and say, what am I doing here? Maybe I should leave. I don't feel part of this. They're all hippies and I'm, I don't know. And what am I doing? And I need to make music. I don't need to be sitting in nature with these people. And, and so I said, okay, today I need to give a workshop. I need to give something. So I said, okay, today at the sunset under that tree, we do a workshop. I'm, I'm starting my workshop. I chose a nice place with shade. And in these gatherings, it was a, a Middle East Peace Rainbow Gathering. That we, uh, Sorry, this was a World Rainbow Gathering. So it was before we started it. And so uh, you cannot go close to the fire. It's not allowed for cars to be in the fire. I see a truck. We hear, you know, from where I'm doing the workshop, a truck in the main fire, people getting off with knapsacks and like 20 more people. I said, fuck, what is this? What's going on? You know, and everybody starts looking. I try to maintain the focus because we're in the middle. And I see they're coming to us. Of all the places in the mountain, they come to where we're doing the workshop. I'm trying to get people focused. And I'm about to do, you know, Zikr. And I'm explaining something about, and then this French guy, he says, Gabriel, Gabriel. He says, Iran, Iran. And I don't know what he's saying. I can't, I said, can you speak louder? And, he's, and he asked the, the people who started sitting down with their bags and knapsacks right there. He said, where are you from? And they say, Iran. And the people in the workshop go, <gasps> Most of her were Israelis, you know, and and then they asked, where are you from? And we say Israel and they go. <gasps> and there was a moment where either I don't know what I don't know what's going to happen. And I said, OK, come in the circle, leave your bags. And we all got in the circle. We start la ilaha illallah, la ilaha. started doing zikr, which is a Sufi ceremony. We did it with Hebrew as Kabbalist and Sufi which has a long tradition of cross-pollination, cross-pollination. And, and um, it was people after 15 minutes started crying and crying and crying and crying. And after an hour of crying, I mean, the camp of Iranians moved to the Israeli camp and we became one camp. And all the Europeans and the Americans couldn't believe it. They said, well, this is the Iranian-Israeli conspiracy. And, and, and how did it happen? It happened when, first of all, we didn't shy away from our identities. Second, I, put, I brought a tradition which they are deeply touched by, which many of their grandparents might have been Sufis. And I brought a tradition for the Jews, Israeli Jews, about you know, names of God in Hebrew, which they might be connected deeply. And we just did breath work, movement, and song. So there was no way for the mind to get in, you know, when you're doing zikr, which is like a heart shower with the Kabbalistic names of the divine and Arabic names of the divine. There's no way to think, no room. It's like a very strong medicine. And the trust was there. I sat with this Iranian woman and we kept on crying for an hour and laughing and crying and arguing. And she moved to my camp. We moved together, the Iranians and Israelis. And we just in the next five days dreamed of four years of activities in the mountains of Turkey, just Middle East peace, you know. And we got a Turk to host, to, to come and host us, and we got a German to be international, and, and there was Israeli and Iranian, you know, and, and that happened for four years. I was part of that. Uh, so trust, as I said, is a very uh, fragile uh, creature, and it has to go uh, at different dimensions. For example, jokes develop trust, when you can laugh with somebody. Uh, lullabies can develop trust. Recipes, yeah. cooking with people. Cooking, yeah. Planting, 
creating a garden, creating a house, a building, all stuff that is not related to the conflict in terms of, you know, like you said, the first week will be taking out the pus out of the wound. Okay, that's being done by TV, by daily reality, by mainstream reality. When we did the Sulha work, I used to say, you know, we focus 90% of our energies in the healing imagination. 10%, okay, we need to know what is the problem with water, who killed who, when was this war, when did that pogrom happen, when did the Holocaust, the Nakba, all of this. But if you spend most of your energy into what already is the main narrative, you will never find a new narrative. Mm. So we have so much potential for healing and medicine. And that has to be channeled into that area of creativity, not, you know, again, talk about the, you know, when, sometimes when you have a, a, a wound and you keep pressing and pressing for pus, it will never heal. Yeah. So, so the, you need the, to get healthy in the body, not in that spot, you know? What, the, yeah, that's one of, the, one of the things I wanted to point out that I'm hearing you say, at least how I'm hearing it, is this, like, there's, so there's a problem. And I've, I've noticed that, for instance, in the field of conflict, conflict resolution and things, that it's like you have to find a resolution. So you have to, as long as you talk things through, you're going to get there. So you need to talk more and... And and I've seen people doing crazy stuff, particularly in that context you are, you are talking about of just like spending time just saying what you are not supposed to talk when you come together, so that when you come together it's not a real meeting. So I'm I'm kind of really wanting to point out that for me it's amazing the way you're bringing things because it's like how we can hold the space for us to be together in our in our deepest humanity core like and, and things that are particularly common to all human beings are the things that connect us you know eating to get cooking eating together song song is such an amazing thing because I, I think it happens in the Middle East the same like in the Balkans that you put a song out there <coughs> a lullaby or a traditional song and then one starts to say hey that's that's mine that's not my culture and the other side no no that's mine and it's like it's like from everybody they just like Get, get a get their own uh, sense from the thing. Yeah, I I think you know like the the word peace uh, is confusing because it comes in from Latin, you know, uh, Pax Pax Romana, which is nothing to do with peace. Pax Romana is what the Romans used to do to the conquered peoples. They used to say, okay, you can do this, but not this, and you have to pay me taxes, and then I let you do this. That was the peace. That was the Pax Romana. In Hebrew and Arabic, shalom and salam have nothing to do with that. It's a holistic, comes from the word a whole. Shalom comes from the word shalem, which means whole. Salam comes from surrender. You know, it's one of the names of God. So in the Sufi tradition, so the the the, the shalom, the salam, the real holistic peace is the one that is like a puzzle. You got to have all the pieces of the puzzle shiny and happy. If not, there won't be, you know? So if only 10 people are happy, if only the, the facilitator of the conflict re resolution workshop is happy, it's not going to happen, you know? Okay, he trained and they're taking all their shit out and he's super proud because look, they cried and they were. But if the trust is not being weaved between the hearts of the people, it's never going to transform. So I, I think one of the main you know, things to pay attention to, this coming from a Kabbalistic studies, is, is, is the, 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 the world of earth has to be a part of it. The body, our bones has to be included, first of all. The word of emotions, of course, has to be the water, the air. But the air is a fourth of ourselves and the fire, the spirit. And we're stuck in the head. Or sometimes, you know, the emotional addicts, they're stuck in the emotion and the head or just the emotion. But we need the four elements. We cannot, you know, transform something only with water. 
or only with the air. We need the earth. We need the fire. We need the four of them at, 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 at a, you know, ecosystem, at a, a, a balanced way. And I, I think that's one of the things to pay attention when you're designing any type of conflict transformation is that you include the body. It could be cooking, like you said. It could be planting. It could be building. It could be dancing. dancing. The, the emotional self, uh, of course, but in ways that are not, you know, reinforcing your patterns in ways that are liberating your patterns. Uh, then the, the, the head, you know, of course, yes, what you think, but that's very little of the transformation is going to come from there. And the spirit, that's a big one, you know, that many of the activists, you know, they don't believe in the divine, don't talk to me, bullshit, you know. Da, da, da. So, um, and, and, and of course, the, the, the spiritual ones that don't want to deal with the body, you know, which is ridiculous. And so there needs to be a, a, a balance and an ecosystem for, for transformation. It can't just happen. And it has to do with creativity again. It has to do with humor. And, and there are many muses, like music, you know, to, to bring people into that field, into that space. And also nature. I think uh, people, when they do conflict transformation in a hotel, you know, it's very different, you know. And they put a panel and they have a microphone and a glass of water and everybody talks their greatest hits, you know, and then comes the women's yeah. panel and then the youth panel. And it's all it's the a, same. It's a show. It's a performance. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So... We we need to start to wrap up. We get okay. into the, the end of our time. I got I got carried away. Sorry. No no no. It was it was awesome, Gabriel. That's, okay. I, I just wanted to kind of sure share a bit of what what came for me. Yes. You talked about you know one of the things that you mentioned a couple of times in your in your life story that for me is like really significant is that you went from a very early age because of the your appearance. In the context you were in, to kind of move move through difficulties by developing empathy, and that's really kind of interesting. I would say we didn't talk about it a lot, but like how to be able to uh, connect with the other and find ways to connect instead of getting stuck on these connections, which could be really problematic for you to be constantly bullied or. Another thing that has come from a lot of your work is this idea of trust and go at the pace of trust. I love that. And there was something about in the story about uh, the, 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 the interfaith meeting in, in uh, I think it was in Jerusalem, right? Uh, yeah, in Tantur, Tantur, yeah. in Monastery, yeah. Where after two days of big tension and not moving and uh, uh, a music, uh, 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 an, uh, an expression of kind of break the tension. So there's this kind of thing about this, something about tension and release that we didn't talk a lot, but it's, I just want to name it for people to kind of think about those things. Tension and release. And there was another thing with the story of the Isra uh, Iranians and Israelis uh, in uh, I think Sinai it was in Sinai, no, in right? Turkey, Turkey. In, Tur in Turkey, right? Where it's about like there's this sense of grieving together, so like really being able to acknowledge the the wounds, but then there's something about imagination also coming from. So there's there's a layer of imagination that is our ability to create in the middle of adversity or of difficult situations. So there's. There's something there in that movement that you didn't talk explicitly, but I felt like something yeah, well, particularly the, special about that. Main, main thing, celebration. That's an, an integral part if you can celebrate, but not make believe you're celebrating, you know, celebrate with someone, really, yeah. from your gut. And that Iranians and Israelis have in common. They love to celebrate, sing, dance, drink, uh, throw everything, anything <laughs> goes. And one of the other things that I didn't mention was that at the Sulha, the, the zooming out, and also in the war in Gaza, we had this camp in 2014 called We Refuse to Be Enemies. Uh, where part of the four people from the Tamera community came to my friend Ali Abu Awad in, 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 uh, near where the war started. They kidnapped these three Jewish kids. 
and we planted trees and we zoomed out of the war, even though we were there without, you know, hearing the bombs and everything. We had no bomb shelters and we had a, like a news meditation where we couldn't respond right away. We could cry or scream, but we couldn't talk for 15 minutes. And that's where I made real relationships with Palestinians because most of the peace movement was even for the war. So we were only 50 people there. And so that zooming out is also what happened in the Sulha where we used to bring, let's say, a, a Native American who suffered you know, racial injustice in the first Sulha. Then we brought a Tibetan who suffered ethnic you know, injustice from the Chinese. Then we brought Irish who had religious injustice between Catholics. And so we always had like a third party. You know, when the family has a third party, you zoom out and you behave because you have guests. And so we had this every year. We had spirit holders, from, not from the Abraham family, who came to, to make sure we behaved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then you zoom out and you see that there is no competition for suffering. No, the Palestinian-Israeli problem is not the worst. There's worse. There's always worse. We're not the worst. We're not, you know, we're not even the worst. So, like, to take proportion, zoom out. It's appropriate to this zoom we're doing. Everybody <laughs> zooming, zooming out is as important as zooming. Yeah, zooming in. in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriel. I don't know if you are in the mood to play one last song, and uh, yeah, sure. it has been a maybe. great conversation. So that would be a beautiful okay. way to. Maybe to I will sing one of mine. It's called Human. Thank you so much. And it's in Spanish, English, and Hebrew. Wow. I can't help it sometimes, you know. I have too many languages in my head. Soy de Oriente y también de Occidente. Soy del Norte y también soy del Sur. Soy piel roja y también amarilla. Soy un negro y también soy un blanco. Soy mujer y también soy un hombre. Soy anciano y también soy un niño. Y vete fila, ti vete fila, y caré, y caré, lejos la mí. Y vete fila, ti vete fila. Y caré, y caré, lejos la mí. Musulmano, hindú, judío y cristiano, animista, budista, teo y del tao, palestino y aborigen hebreo, soy beduino, irlandés, argentino, soy de Atlantis, de Senegal, australiano, de la India, ruso, esquimal y de Francia, te mochaví. For all people, so for all people, just like you and me. And our temple shall be for all people, to heal. for all people, just like you and me. It all started in a dream. Mother Teresa, Bob Marley, and Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan in Jerusalem. The dream then becomes a vision. The healer is releasing the racial, religious, and ethnic root stress knots of our planet. Kashmir, Wounded Knee, and Gore Island, Lhasa, Uluru, Kosovo, and Jerusalem. The Spirit Security Council guarding the old city, the Dalai Lama, and Desmond Tutu, Amaji, and Tiknat Khan, Messi, Pele, and Maradona, and respected elders from the three local religions. The vision becomes prophecy. And our temple shall be for all people to heal, for all people, just like you and me. Eh, me un templo será para os povos curar, para todos, como eu e você. And our temple shall be for all people to heal, for all people, just like you and me. Soy muy alto y también muy petizo. Soy muy gordo y también soy muy flaco. Soy peludo y 
también soy pelado, cúpulo, soy también un escuálido, soy de luz y me amamanta el planeta. Yo respiro y al gran nombre bendigo. And I am for shopping, for all people's to be, for all people, just like you and me. And our temple shall be for all peoples to heal, for all people, just like you and me. Gracias, hermano. De nada. Obrigado. Thank you so much. It was great. Beautiful. Thank you for this time. Yeah.